Hey everybody, welcome back. Last week we talked about reductionist theories, or Waltz did. He went through reductionist theories and went through all the problems. Um, in one of the major reductionist theories, especially of his time, was which was the Hobson-Lenin paradigm for explaining um, how capitalism results in imperialism and war. Uh, explains the problems with that as a way of illustrating problems with reductionist theories in general. Um, today, this week, we're actually going to go through chapters 3 and 4, because I think we can move more swiftly through chapter 3 now. I think you should be getting an idea of Waltz's argument, getting an idea of his criticisms of, uh, of reductionism. Uh, and chapter 3 reveals, it's supposed to be about systemic theories, but he reveals that for the most part, those allegedly systemic theories are actually reductionist in nature as well, with all the problems of reductionist theories that he gives us. Um, chapter 4, then, begins to look at, you start to get an inkling, a bit of a look in about what a structure, what a, a structural theory can actually show, and uh, how structure can be defined, and also a bit more on why reduction will never result in the proper type of, of understanding that we want, or why reduction alone. Um, he's also very clear now about, um, or he'll get into in chapter 4, what a structural theory can and cannot do, um, and that we also must be careful not to make the opposite of the reductionist error, which is to assume that, okay, now we have the structure, we don't need to learn about states. That's not the truth at all. We need both, but we need to clearly separate them. We need to be aware of what is a structural influence and what is state level or unit level or lower, and we need to keep them separate or we will not understand. That's basically the topic for today in those two chapters. I've uh, explained much less. I leave you to do much more with chapter three. Um, I think that will be helpful so we can move through a bit more quickly. I give, give you a bit more of an overview and you can rely a bit more on reading because I'm, I want people to think more for themselves. I don't want to spoon feed it to you, um, but also because I don't think you need the help anymore. I think uh, things should move a bit more swiftly now. Uh, and this will get us done with everything in a few weeks as well. So it will be finished a little bit faster. All right. Let's get started. All right, so as I just mentioned, um, and as you'll remember, last week was about reductionist approaches and looking at Lenin and Hobson's attempt to explain imperialism and war via an economic analysis. And two key questions arise from that that I want you to think about, um, and I hope that you, you know the answer at least to the first one, um, is why was the Lenin-Hobson approach reductionist? Do you understand why that would be? That's really important. If you don't understand, um, spend some time thinking about them. Understand what makes reductionism. All right. Uh, and the second question is, what would a systemic approach look like? Um, we're starting to get an we're we're starting to get an idea of why reductionist approaches may not be enough. But what the heck does a systemic approach look like? And today we're finally going to really start to answer that. Chapter three gets beginnings of that through a critical process, and chapter four finally turns that criticism into something positive and begins to create something. So you'll get inklings of that today, which I think is exciting. Um, I know when I got to chapter four the first time I read it, I started to think, okay, this is getting interesting now. Less abstract sort of telling why everything doesn't work, and more, uh-huh, this is a proposal for something that could work. So let's jump right in. And this tells you what we're going to discuss today, again, chapters 3 and 4. Um, chapter 3 will answer other scholars, um, will provide other scholars' answers to the second question about what a systemic theory would look like. Waltz tears those apart, saying they're mostly reductionist themselves, or they confuse systemic and, and um, reductionist approaches so much that their, their theories reveal very little. Chapter 4 will explain the, the limitations of both approaches and then turn to what a systemic approach should entail and what it can and cannot explain. That's where it gets really interesting, and I'm going to push through to get to that fairly quickly today. So hold on tight. So it should be quite clear that economics does affect politics, but also that politics affects economics. So that should tell you right there that a theory about economics effects on politics is not enough because the, the causation goes in the other direction as well. On top of that, this also does not deny that some political outcomes may have solely political causes or nearly solely political causes, that economics may not be really part of it at all. So saying that a theory about international economics tells us something about politics, which uh, is undeniable, um, and that a theory of international politics can tell us something about economics, which is also surely true, does not mean that one such theory can substitute for the other. And an example he uses is in telling us about uh, living things, 
telling us something about living beings, chemistry does not replace biology. You still need both. Just because one will tell us something doesn't mean it tells us everything. All right, so here he's getting to a criticism of his economic approaches to politics. We need political theories as well, ones that aren't just about economics. Let's start off with having a look at some laws. So one law that is reductionist and economic would be if capitalism, then imperialism. Um, another law, which would be systemic and economic, is uh, if faced with little competition, firms will keep prices and profits high. If faced with heavy competition from other firms, firms will cut prices and eat into profits. profits. That's systemic and economic. The theories that go with these are the Lennon-Hobson theory of economic sources of imperialism, and the second one is classical economic theory of markets, how markets affect the behavior of firms. So do we have any political laws? We just saw some economic laws. Um, a couple I could think of. Uh, if democratic, then peaceful is one. And that's a reductionist and political law. It's not mentioned in this book, but it is one. And sorry about the typo. This is the second or third one I've seen already. Um, a preview of chapter six. If faced with potential opponents with unbalanced power, states seek balance. That's a systemic and political law. Um, the theories associated with these, well, the first one, there is no real theory behind it, actually. It's called democratic peace theory, <clears throat> but it's actually just a contested observation. The theory to explain why that would be so is not very well put, to say the least. Maybe it's nascent. We can be optimistic and say it's nascent. Um, the theory behind the second law is coming later. And at this juncture, I'd just like to mention that when he talks about an analytic approach, it's the same thing as a reductionist approach. Analytic equals reductionist. Um, if you choose a reductionist or analytic approach, you need to be able to hold other things equal. Um, it's been very common to use this in science. If you can run experiments, that's perfect. Then you can use a reductionist approach. And you should prefer it to a systemic approach wherever possible because it's much simpler. It's much easier to conduct and its results are much clearer. Unfortunately, politics does not lend itself very easily to an analytic approach. Uh, it will be sufficient only where systems level effects are absent or are weak enough to be ignored. It will be insufficient and a systems approach will be needed if outcomes are affected not only by the properties and interconnections of variables, but also by the way they are organized. So keep in mind, I added the emphases here, keep in mind that Waltz is saying we need an approach in addition to reductionism, not as a replacement for it. That should be very clear, because that's often a criticism of realism, um, that it ignores things at state level and below. It does not. He's not saying that. He's saying we need to also understand that there are additional forces working above the state level. All right, so the idea here is that the way that units are organized may affect their behavior and interactions. Um, and if that's true, that means that we can't predict outcomes or understand them by knowing the, the characteristics and purposes of the system's units. And many of you will have noticed over time, if you're studying international politics, that war and peace have occurred throughout history between different types of actors. Um, and so Walt says, looking at that, where similarity of outcomes, i.e. war and peace, prevails despite changes in the agents, the states, that seem to produce them, we suspect something systemic is affecting the actors, not just their own intentions. Again, we're aware here that the agents, the states, seem to be the root cause of, of all of the issues. It seems that states, they declare war, they start wars. So what in the world else can we be looking at? How can we construct a theory that goes beyond that? Patience, please, we're getting there. But yeah, um, it should also be apparent that states sometimes get sucked into wars they don't want. Um, similarity of outcomes despite different intentions. All right, and here Waltz puts forward a kind of confusing um, definition of what a system is. He, said it's a, he says it's a set of interacting units that at one level consists of a structure, which makes it possible to think of the units as forming a set um, rather than a mere collection. Um, at another level, the system consists of interacting units. So we have a structure above and the interacting units below. That's the point. Um, and to understand how any two things, A and B, affect each other, we obviously must be able to distinguish between A and B. In this case, A is the structure and B is the interacting units uh, within that system. 
and the system contains both. So the system is the units and the structure. And his focus is always on the structure, a structural analysis. That's, that's why I always call neorealism structural realism, because it's about the structure above the interacting units. We must differentiate between the structure of the system, which is the international realm, and its parts, which is the states and their makeups, leaders, economic models, etc. And any theory that does not make this distinction and keep it clear is not truly systemic. All right, so what should good systems theory do? It should specify precisely systemic forces and their effects. So it should tell you what, what sort of top-down forces are happening and what kind of effect they have. Um, it should tell you which units the system comprises and indicate the comparative weights of systemic and subsystemic causes, which means they should also tell you which is more important in a given situation, the top-down effects or the bottom-up effects, effects coming from states or from the structure. And it should tell you how forces and effects change from one system to another. So you should be able to predict and explain, first of all, tell what a system's change would entail, and then tell what kind of effects we expect to see from a different system from that sort of change. And the rest of the chapter examines the worth of th work of three then-prominent systems theorists, and I think it's quite noticeable uh, or notable that in 1979, these systems theorists were prominent, and today, most of you probably will never have heard of them. Um, and he examines, it, examines their theories to see how they measure up. Spoiler alert, they don't. All right, I want you all to read the rest of the chapter because I think it's, it provides important insights, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot more time on it because I think you can read it on your own and the conclusions from it are most important. And I'll go through the criticisms in a nutshell. Um, his criticism of Rosecrans is that it is actually a reductionist rather than a systemic approach. Um, by seeing, specifically, he sees structure, the way he defines structure, it looks like just another actor within the system, which makes it reductionist. It's coming from below rather than above. Hoffman, he says, has no actual theory, just a commitment to a particular intellectual approach. And Kaplan fails to establish the identity of a system as distinct from its environment and its parts. So he gets things all kind of confused. So his conclusion is that no systems approach thus far attempted, that means pre-1979, was actually systemic. So until that time, there was no true neo-realist or structural realist approach. Okay, we now move on to the constructive part of the book. The first few chapters were highly critical. This chapter starts to build something rather than tearing down other things. Um, but it will still start with a um, discussion of the defects of the theories thus far covered. But then it will move on to what a systems theory comprises and what it can and cannot do. So it can tell us what, what we can expect from it and what we shouldn't expect from a systems theory, what its limitations are, and when we'll need a different theory, i.e. a reductionist or analytical approach, when we'll need to look at states, uh, when we need to look at leaders, the composition of their governments, etc., which is still important. And he'll tell us when we need to look at that and when we need to look more at the structure. All right, in the first part of chapter four here, um, in, in part one, Maltz talks about how persistent reductionism is. We can't seem to get away from it. He's shown that there aren't really any truly systemic theories, which means they've all been reductionist so far. Um, it's important to understand what the difference is. Both reductionist and systemic theories deal with events at all levels, from subnational to supranational. So a reductionist theory will also talk about international political outcomes. So what a theory covers and what it purports to explain is not different. But reductionist ones start at the bottom, at the national level, i.e. Uh, whether a state is a democracy, or the subnational level, how its bureaucracy is ordered, how social mo movements within it uh, make a difference. You know, if you have a pa large pacifist movement in a country, you expect that to have an impact on, on how uh, the state will, will act externally, especially if that pacifist group gets into the government, if it has a political party. Um, and so a reductionist theory would take that and use that to explain international outcomes. And as he comments, rather frustrated, um, he says, few, it seems, can consistently escape from the belief that international political outcomes are determined rather than merely affected by what states are like. So he's saying these do affect international political outcomes, but they don't determine them. There's something else missing, the structural effects. Later on in chapter 4, part 1, Waltz discussed traditionalists versus modernists. Um, this is not something that we 
still tend to use these terms. Um, to me, it seems traditionalists here are the realists, and modernists would be everyone else. Um, liberals, um, those who use Marxist theory, constructivists perhaps as well, um, although I'm not sure constructivism was really around yet, although I think it began in the 60s. In any case, he notes that the traditionalists say that the domestic systems are hierarchical and international ones are anarchic, which you've heard already in this book, so that puts Waltz a bit in the traditionalist camp, and modernists tend not to recognize this distinction. They view it as, for some reason, not important. Um, but Waltz still argues that even traditionalists then go on to find causes for international political outcomes within national politics, and this is what he calls being subsystem dominant. So the explanations are found below the systemic level. Um, they'll still say it's reactionary states or it's um, revolutionary states that are causing problems. There are states that are revolutionary and um, revisionist and wish to change borders and they're what cause instability. If any reductionist theory is followed to its conclusion, then, since international political outcomes are determined by what states are like, then we must, if necessary, do something to change them. So I say reductionism leads inexorably to neoconservatism. Of course, I mean that half-jokingly, but neoconservatism is a school based on reductionist ideology, or reductionist ideas. There are definite limits to reductionism. Inside out or reductionist explanations always produce results like that of Kissinger's analysis on page 63. Um, and Walt says of that, Kissinger's saying that international instability and war are caused by the existence of revolutionary states amounts to saying that wars occur because some states are warlike, which is not particularly helpful. And yet, revolutionary regimes may tend towards peaceful coexistence because the pressures of their external situations overwhelm their internally stated aims. And the converse of that is also true. Um, peaceful states, or status quo states, may tend towards uh, violence or war if external pressures, um, the, or the, the pressures of their external situations, external pressures, overwhelm their internally stated aims of peace. There are forces acting on states outside of individual states control and even beyond the control of all states together. Waltz now goes on to argue that a world of stable, legitimately run, non-revolutionary, non-revisionist states would still be unstable, because if each state strove only for security and had no designs on its neighbors, in other words, um, no desire to change borders or take resources or anything else, all states would nevertheless remain insecure, for the means of security for one state are, in their very existence, the means by which other states are threatened. One cannot infer the condition of international politics from the internal composition of states. This is what you know is the security dilemma. If I have a military just to protect myself, it may make my neighbors insecure. So they need a military to protect themselves. Then I wonder why they're building up their military, which makes me insecure. It seems like the solution would be for just for everybody to get rid of their militaries, right? But how do you do that? If you get rid of yours first and your neighbors don't, you're weak and defenseless. They need to get rid of theirs at the same time. How can you be sure that everyone's going to get rid of them at the same time? This is a systemic effect. Um, and he goes on to argue that traditionalists and modernists both fall into the same trap. Despite their different methods, their approaches are actually reductionist. So no difference between realists and all the others. They have reductionist approaches so far. Waltz will be the only one to put forward, even the only realist, to put forward a true systems approach. If changes in international outcomes are linked directly to changes in actors, how can one account for the similarities of outcome that persist or recur even as actors vary? And you'll find some examples of this on page uh, 66 in the first paragraph. Um, he talks about how there have been constants through time. Um, the relations that prevail internationally seldom shift rapidly in type or in quality. They are marked instead by dismaying persistence, a persistence of war, particularly in certain regions and certain areas, a persistence that one must expect so long as none of the, co -op, uh, the competing units, the states, is able to convert the anarchic international realm into a hierarchic one. Most people will agree with this, and yet reductionism continues. Most people agree that there is something beyond the control of individual states, or even really groups of states, that they cannot get together and, and just agree to cooperate, and yet reductionism continues. And a notable quote on this on page 67, if an indicated condition seems to have caused a given war, 
one must wonder what accounts for the repetition of wars even if their as their causes vary. Um, those of you who were my students in Art of War and read Michael Howard's book, um, which looked for the causes of war throughout time, all the liberal theories of war, each, each period in each set of theories thought they found different causes of war that seemed plausible, and yet wars have continued throughout time. So something else is going on. It's not these individual causes within states. At least that's not enough. If the same effects follow from different causes, then constraints must be operating on the independent variables in ways that affect outcomes. Um, all of you are hopefully familiar with the idea of independent versus dependent variables. Independent variables are the inputs, the causes, and the dependent variables are the effects or the outputs. Um, and we're getting different dependent variables or sorry, the same dependent variables with different independent variables. Many causes, same effects. So we know that there's some sort of constraints must be operating on the independent variables. We cannot predict the behavior of states or statesmen though. So how in the world can we create a theory of international politics to comprehend indeterminate behavior? How can we create a theory about what's going to happen if we can't know how states will react? We can't predict what's in the heads of world leaders and what they'll do. If we could, <clears throat> things would be a lot easier. Since a variety of, variety of actors and the variation uh, and variations in their actions are not matched by the variety of outcomes, we know that systemic causes are in play. We may be able to get a, a better look at what these constraining systemic causes are in order to develop a theory about how they affect individual actors. Okay, so I think by now, hopefully, you understand the need for a systemic theory, why we need one that moves beyond reductionism. So what must the, the systemic theory do? Uh, first off, of course, it must explain, and that means to say why the range of expected outcomes falls within certain limits, to say why patterns of behavior recur, to say why events repeat themselves, including events that none or few of the actors may like. Um, systems theories explain and predict continuity within a system. A systems theory shows why changes at the unit level produce less change of outcomes than one would expect in the absence of systemic constraints. So its predictions will be general. It will indicate some of the conditions that make war more or less likely, but it will not predict the outbreak of individual wars. Neorealism cannot predict that. It predicts continuity, and it predicts the forces that are going to act on states, but how those states react to those forces, it cannot predict. But we can say, who? Oh, this is going to cause tension. We're pushing states towards tension. Or we can look at areas and say, well, there aren't systemic forces causing tension, but there could be ethnic forces causing tension, which are completely outside of the system. So we still need to know both. But I think he has shown very clearly that not knowing about the systemic causes will mean that we'll never be able to understand war. So a systems theory explains continuity, but it can also explain changes, um, but it only explains changes when there's a change of systems or structure. Consider, the European powers were the great powers for a long time, and during that time, unity between European powers was little more than a dream, because politics among them was essentially a zero-sum game. If one European power gained, the others had, were afraid of it. There were shifting alliances to constrain this. There needed to be some sort of balance of power. They were afraid of each other. They couldn't simply cooperate or unify or come together. That would have been seen as totally insane. Um, but the emergence of the Russian and American superpowers after World War II created a situation that permitted wider ranging and more effective cooperation between the states of, of Western Europe. The determinants of war and peace lay outside Europe. And he notes on the bottom of page 70, not all impediments to cooperation were removed, but one important one was the fear that the greater advantage of one would be translated into military force to be used against the others. So all the differences between European states, of course, remained. All their political differences, their cultural differences, uh, and many of the reasons why they disliked each other still remained, but they were no longer afraid of each other. Um, conflicts of interest remain to this day, and we see them all the time, and the forces against um, European unification continue to work um, in the ways that forces against unification always work. Um, but the expectation that someone will use force to resolve these conflicts of interest is now gone, which is the, the main, the key factor driving the ability of Europe to unify after World War II. 
Okay, so what can the theory do and what can it not do? Um, and there's supposed to be theory in the title. It's supposed to be what, what the theory can not do. Um, it can describe a range of likely outcomes within a given system and how this range would likely change if the system changed. It can describe and understand the pressure on states. It cannot predict how states will react to those pressures without knowledge of their internal dispositions. That's important. A systems theory explains changes across systems, not within them, and yet international life within a given system is by no means all repetition. Important discontinuities occur. If they occur within a system that endures, so the system hasn't changed, then the causes are found at the unit level. Systems theories explain why different units behave similarly and produce outcomes that fall within expected ranges. Why a dictatorship and a democracy might behave in similar ways if they are similarly placed within the structure of the system. Theories at the unit level will tell us why different units behave differently despite their similar placement within the system. So a dictatorship and a democracy quite often may display different behavior even if they are similarly placed. And to the extent that they do, that will be explained by differences between them at the unit level. To think that a theory of international politics can, in itself, say how states will cope with international pressures is the opposite of the reductionist error. That means it is to think that we can understand fully without gathering data. The reductionist error was to think we, we get loads and loads of data, the more and more data eventually will understand something. Walt says, no, we need a top-down approach. We need a theory approach that comes from outside of data gathering. But he's not saying we don't need data. He's not saying we don't need to understand what states are like and what policies are like and, um, and what social movements are going on within a state. No, he's saying that knowing that, however, is not enough. We need both. And nobody had put together a real systems theory before him. He's saying with this theory, we'll have the pieces of the puzzle we need. So what the heck is structure? Well, structure, there are two meanings that you can put forward from social science, at least in 1979. Um, one is that it's a compensating device, um, like the liver or like some other bodily organ where you have you eat different things, but it maintains your blood sugar level. That's the example that he uses. So you have the same blood sugar level despite different inputs. Um, and these are agents or contrivances that should be or not of acting within the system. Um, the liver is an agent. It's inside the system. It's not up above the system in some way. It's a, it's a piece uh, within the system. The second meaning is a set of constraining conditions. And this type of structure acts as a selector rather than an agent. And they select by rewarding some behaviors and punishing others. And that way, outcomes cannot be inferred from intentions. And we can think of how a free market economy works with competition between firms. Or think of natural selection in biology. That's the one I think of. Um, natural selection is not an agent. It's not like there's a natural selector that walks through and kills animals it personally deems to be unfit. No, um, it's, it's not at the level of the system like another animal going through and killing. It's above the system. It's created by the system itself. Um, it's invisible, but it really does select. <clears throat> Animals really do, species really do have to adapt over time or die out. So its effects are real, and yet it itself is not real in any physical sense. There is no actual selector. But that is how structure can select and how structure can act as a selector. And that's the type of structure that Waltz is talking about here, the second meaning. And here Waltz argues that structure works in two ways. One of them is socialization, the other is competition. Um, and he says that interactions between states are more than the sum of each state's intentions in those interactions. And you can look at the, the George and Martha example from the top of page 75. I don't think you need to have read or seen Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf to understand it. Um, the point is that the two get caught in a sort of dynamic. Um, and that dynamic between them is more than, than just their intentions. Um, neither of them mean to escalate in the way that it does, um, but it does. And we've all been in those sorts of situations where you may want to exit an argument. You have no intention of getting in an argument with this person. You just want to relax. You just want things to be nice. And yet you feel yourself kind of getting sucked in. That's socialization in that actions and reactions build on each other and can lead to events that neither of you actually wanted in the first place. That's one way that structure works. 
All right, in the second process, competition, um, here the, the good example is on, the, um, on page 76 with the shoe store. Now, economic theory assumes rationality, and that's okay, actually, because some firms may be irrational and some may not be trying to maximize profit, while others might try to but be inept. But the firms that do best, who sell the most, who set the right prices, who control costs, who put their stores in the right locations, will do well. The others will go bust. And so the result will be the rational firms that are good at what they do will be the ones that survive. Um, the other firms will go under because the customers will shift to the stores that have the best shoes, the best quality, the best prices, the best service, um, and the best locations. And fewer of them will go to the other stores. If the other firms wish to survive, they must adopt similar policies. They have to also start looking at their cost structure. They also have, also have to look at their customer service, their, sh their store locations, and things like that. And they may imitate their competitors with what they see works for their competitors. Um, otherwise, they'll go bankrupt. And thus, the units that survive come to look like one another. It's not socialization, but it has a similar effect. They start to look the same. And so patterns emerge and endure without anyone arranging those patterns or working to maintain them. That's a systemic effect. It's completely outside of the intention of any individual firm. And with states, it's quite similar. Things happen that are completely outside of the intention of individual leaders or states or their electorates. All right, and the last section of chapter four is really a setup for chapter five. Um, important is if structure influences without determining. So it doesn't determine the outcomes, but it has a definite influence on them, I think Waltz can show. Um, then one must ask how and to what extent the structure of a realm accounts for outcomes, and how and to what extent the units do. So they're both um, at least equally important. Is structure more important in certain, certain situations and less important in others? If so, when and how do we know? What is the extent of that, that weighting in either direction? And Waltz believes, another typo, that uh, blurring the lines between structure and units has impeded understanding. The next chapter will seek to define political structures in a way that makes the construction of a systems theory possible. So he starts to define structures and, and put things together in a little bit more exact way next week. We're going to go through chapters 5 and 6 next week. We're going to move forward with the, the building up of his theory. Things are going to get progressively more interesting. And I hope this week, I mean, I found chapter four, chapters one through three, a lot of theory, a lot of criticism. You start to think, yeah, okay. Chapter four, I found at least quite interesting. Things really started to turn around and I could start to see bits of how the theory could come together and what sorts of things they could explain in, in an exciting way, at least for me. Again, if you have any questions, um, post those in the comment section below this video. Um, or on the Facebook page as well. And um, I, a number of you have talked to a few people, you are behind on the videos and probably gonna watch them on your own time. It's summer, you're working, um, that's fine. I hope to get some videos in, uh, some questions in before the end. And I'll have a follow-up video um, after all of this. I'm actually gonna be away for a bit, so it'll probably be a couple weeks after the last um, presentation we can get together I might do a live YouTube event where we can finally discuss the book as a whole and talk about any questions you might have that's my my current plan um, see you next week by Tuesday at 5 p.m. and um, hope you enjoyed it talk to you soon